Hey soccer fans, this is Nick for Sons of a Pitch Soccer Central. First off, I want to wish all of the mothers out there happy Mother's Day. I hope you got to spend a lot of time with your families. I hope all of our viewers and listeners got to spend some time with their mothers because it's the mothers, it's the soccer moms who really were the foundation of my youth, my childhood playing soccer. Mike, I'm sure you could say the same as well as anyone else who was out there playing. So thank you to the moms. God bless you, wishing you all the best with your families and all the future generations of soccer players and soccer moms out there, wishing you nothing but the best. Anyway, we are back to recap all things MLS Week 10. What a weekend in MLS. There were goals, late game dramatics, and unfortunately some injury news. And we're going to cover it all in the next hour or so. Now, let's get into that intro. <laughs> I, I just music makes me feel like dancing a little bit a little, little pump in action here what we do i know you guys love that intro music it gets you psyched up to talk soccer it gets me psyched up to talk soccer especially here at week 10 in the mls in major league soccer again i am your host nick happy to be back as part of sons of a pitch soccer central huge thanks to mike for bringing me back for allowing me to talk with you all again we're continuing the new format i'm recording the video and then live in the chat with you all and so hopefully you're enjoying the time enjoying all of our time together as we do week in and week out here at sop soccer and like i said if you do enjoy it make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel share it with your friends and family if you hate it if you don't like anything we're doing well, then spam it out to all your terrible coworkers and bosses and people you don't like and let them suffer through it too. Anyway, we are growing the channel. We think we're growing the sport of soccer through conversation here. Uh, so make sure you support us as well. Send us a super chat. Subscribe to the channel with a paid subscription to get all the bonuses that come along with it. Discounted merchandise, extra emojis, bonus content out there for all you strategic investors gambling yes that's gambling that's what i'm talking about it's blown up in the u.s and you know what from what i've seen with mike's picks and predictions the odds makers and the bookies have not quite caught up yet to mls soccer so if you know the league you could probably get in on that and make a few bucks on it anyway make sure you subscribe get your paid subscription so you can see all of mike's betting picks, picks and predictions and all the advice he has to give again follow along on Twitter at SOP Central. Follow my personal Twitter handle at Wife Kids House. And if you like what I do, jump on over and subscribe to my channel as well, Wife Children House on YouTube. We do statistical breakdowns of the Chicago Fire matches. And I'm writing a few scripts for some soccer sketch comedy that hopefully you guys will like. We're going to do something with the Seattle Sounders in a, in a little bit. Maybe a little uh, prosecution defense on how good are the Seattle Sounders. Anyway, without further ado, and that's the perfect segue to get into our weekly recap, the Seattle Sounders, let's hit it, right? So the Seattle Sounders, congratulations on becoming the first MLS team to win CONCACAF Champions League, and also just congratulations, Sounders, for winning the trophy, right? We don't want to make this all about the MLS doing great. This is for the Sounders. This is their trophy. Their fans have stuck by them. Their players have focused on this. But really, the Sounders as an organization prioritized CCL as much as they prioritized anything else. It was their goal to win trophies. They identified this as one they wanted to win. And they went out and got it done. For you detractors, I don't care if Tigres and Monterey and Club America weren't part of this tournament. You know what? They beat the best Mexican team under the rules of the tournament. And they not only did that... But they dominated the entire tournament. Let's see. On aggregate now, they beat Motagua 5-0, Leon 4-1, NYCFC 4-2, and Pumas 5-2, never losing a game. They had a few draws, but Seattle never lost a game, and their worst series was versus the other MLS side, NYCFC, 4-2 on aggregate, right? So congratulations, Sounders. Congratulations to the league. Really looking forward to it. We did also mention in my intro that there's some injury news. 
that is going to be relevant to this league. And this is it, right? Jao Paulo goes out for the season with a torn ACL. You hate to see it. So those non-contact injuries. Who knows what's going on? And we'll talk a little bit more about another big injury that took place uh, down south later on in this rundown. Now, let's move into some of the league games. Wednesday, May 4th, midweek game, Cincinnati 2, Toronto 0. This is the second game in a week for these two teams to play each other. The second win for FC Cincinnati and a second-minute goal by Harris kicked things off for the Orange and Blue. And then things go from bad to worse for Toronto FC because they pick up a red card in the sixth minute. Clearly a turning point in this game. Like, we've seen TFC battle back. We know they're mentally strong, at least at that point. I'm going to question it in a little bit. But then to see them get this red card and be down a man for essentially the entire match, it was just too much for them. Now, looking at this red card, I think the referee got it right. It was a, a yellow card. They went to VAR. He came in and he reversed it. It, it was a red card. It was a red card. Uh, Ralph Presombange comes in, studs up at the knee of the other player. And not just that, he jumps. He leaves his feet to go into the tackle. It wasn't a straight slide. So by all definitions, this is a red card. I'm good with the call. Despite Michael Bradley all up in the referee's face saying, it's only the fourth minute. It's only the fourth minute. Uh, it doesn't matter. Red cards are red cards are red cards are red card, right? That's what we want out of our officiating is consistency, both within a game and throughout the league. If a yellow card is, if it's a foul in the first minute, it's a foul in the 90th. If it's a red in the first, it's a red in the 90th. If it's a foul, whether it's in or outside of the box, you got to call it a PK. We want consistency. They got it on this one. Unfortunately, it did not help out TFC. Now let's share the screen here and let's dive into some of the statistics that we are looking at in these games, right? So looking at Cincinnati and Toronto, Cincinnati actually dominated the possession, dominated the shots, dominated the passing, an all-around excellent game by Cincinnati to defeat TFC. Now let's go take a look down here at the expected goals, something I always like to look at. 4.4 expected goals by Cincinnati. That is how good their chances were that they were expected to score over four goals this game. They only come away with two, so let's work on the finishing Cincinnati. But that is how great of an offensive output Cincinnati was having. Anyway, what do we got? What do we got next here? Sorry, let me maximize my screen for everybody here. Like I said, I'm still kind of getting used to some of this uh, some of this new technology we got going on with StreamYard here. So again, 4.4 total expected goals. We'll bring it back up and we'll show you those statistics again, what I was talking about. 60% possession for Cincinnati. 542 passes at an 85% completion rate. Fantastic stuff for Cincinnati. And again, the goal scorers, Harris and Acosta with the PK. Now let's look at the next match of the week. This is Charlotte beating Miami 1-0 with a Shinashiki goal in the 68th minute for Charlotte being the difference. We saw Shinashiki make the move from Colorado to Charlotte. Colorado brings in Zardis. Right now, Charlotte got the better end of that deal because their guy in the trade scored a goal and Zardis hasn't yet. So anyway, Charlotte, let's take a look at these statistics here. About even as far as the percentage of possession goes, but we see Charlotte having the edge on passing. Now, that kind of makes me think that they get the goal, despite the even possession, that they probably had some more attacking chances. And looking at the three offsides calls, as well as corner kicks, where is that? 11 corners, 17 crosses. So they were definitely getting into those dangerous areas. And for those that watched the game, did you agree do these stats back up your eye test on this one? Is Charlotte the aggressor despite having about the same possession as Miami? So as we continue down going into some of the more advanced statistics of it, look, we got the passes in the final third. They're completing passes there at a decent rate. 
And then looking at XG, 1.7. So almost two expected goals for Charlotte here. They had a couple quality chances, and they come away with a one nothing win. Now, it's not all doom and gloom for Miami here, right? Miami has had a, a good stretch recently, right? A few good games, and they're going to cool off. It's so difficult to win games in this league, let alone extended winning streaks and point streaks, right? That's why we make such a big deal of it when it does happen. So Miami, not the end of the world. Yes, you are dropping points to a conference opponent, and we're going to look at the standings at the end of the show. So we'll see how much it affects them, but you know what? I wouldn't be worried if I'm Miami, at least because of this performance. There might be other things you want to worry about, Maybe some player development. Maybe, you know, if Neville's the right coach, if he's going to hack it here, if Higuain's ever going to come back and do anything for him, right? Um, but in this particular one-game scenario, I'm not worried if you're Miami. And if I'm Charlotte, you take the win and you run with it. Now, next game up. Montreal dominates Orlando 4 to 1. And this might be Montreal's best game of the season, if only from a goal scoring perspective, right? You've got Waterman, Mihailovic, Torres, and Brodke Yard all scoring. And not only that, they're dominating the possession. Look at these shots 20 shots, 10 on goal for Montreal. Meanwhile, Orlando has one shot on goal and two shots overall. That's incredible. That is how good Montreal's defense was playing because it's not like they dominated like 75-25 possession like we've seen some NYCFC games go. 60-40 essentially here, right? So that means Orlando actually did have some opportunities to try and attack and just couldn't do it. And Orlando had an 84% pass completion rate. So that all tells me that Montreal's defense was really playing well this game despite the one goal from Moutinho uh, for Orlando in the 72nd minute to kind of make it look a little more respectable. And at that time, pull the game back to 2-1. to one, uh, or Orlando just did not have the offense going in this game. Um, and to that point, great on Montreal. Orlando pulls one back, and they're not just going to try and kill off 20 minutes. Nope, they come back and put two more in the back of the net to really stick it to Orlando. Uh, yellow cards here, you see six yellow cards in this game, similar to the trends we've seen the last couple weeks. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't start to hit these teams with yellow card accumulation suspensions, though I do expect it will at some point in the near future. Now here's the big thing, right? Orlando could not find that final pass. That could not find that pass to lead to the great shooting opportunity. They had 59% completion rate in the final third. Now let's check out the XG. Orlando, 0.2 XG. Again, they had nothing going. Meanwhile, Montreal far exceeds their expected goals of 3.3. This is great for Montreal. We're going to take a look at the standings and see how high Montreal has climbed just in a couple of short weeks. Mihailovic continues his Dark Horse MVP campaign, and Montreal playing better than they have in the last several seasons. Credit Wilfred Nance. Next match, Atlanta rolls Chicago 4-1. to one. It's Just a terrible performance by Chicago. They looked lost. And at this point, I'm going to tell all of our viewers and listeners, go subscribe to our podcast, Sons of a Pitch podcast, wherever you get your podcast. We're on Apple iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're on all of them, right? Google, you name it. I think we're even on Spotify now. Mike, did you get that done? I think it's done. So get on the podcast, and you will hear a full Chicago Fire summary, recap, breakdown, and maybe even a, a look forward from our good friend, John Donovan, who's been a supporter of the Chicago Fire for years, who knows the game and the franchise in and out, as well as a big supporter of ours here at Sons of a Pitch Soccer Central. So go get on the podcast, listen to John's words about the fire, and uh, just be ready. I don't think he has too many good ones after this performance. I'll let you know. Additionally, make sure you subscribe to my channel, Wife Children House on YouTube, so you can get that statistical breakdown of the fire coming out every, you know, Monday or Tuesday after the game. Moving right along here, folks, we stay out east with the New York Red Bulls hosting the Portland Timbers and playing them to a 1-1 draw. 
Now, I kind of look at this. I'm like, all right, this is okay for Portland. You're playing a non-conference team. They haven't won a game in a month, not since April 9th. You know, Rocky, you out there, Portland fans, let us know. Did, how, how did this lineup look to you? Was, was Portland running out guys looking for three points here? Or were they just kind of playing their usual, you know, were they look playing usual suspects? Were they playing their kind of backups and bench guys rotating a squad as they head cross country? It, it looked like they played most of their starters to me, but I will let the Portland Timbers experts weigh in on that. But either way, Nishgoda with the 53rd minute goal and then Aaron Long for the Red Bulls. Long is back, baby. He gets the equalizer in the 67th minute. That knee is looking fine. I really do want to talk about this goal for a minute because it, it's off a corner kick and it's set piece. And it's a trend that I'm noticing in MLS a little bit more frequently. The cross comes in from the corner and the Red Bull player on the far post does not try to head it on the goal. He is not shooting. He immediately is heading it back to the middle and he heads it down towards Long's feet. We've seen Orlando do this. They did it against Chicago. Uh, where Pato is on the far post of, of a set piece, and he instead heads it up and back across Ferris and Cara to net a uh, far post for the Orlando City against the Fire. So we're seeing these set pieces go far post and being headed back across goal. It, it, it seems to be a, a play that these teams work on. Either that or these players who are receiving that first pass, like they, they can't do anything with it, so they're just playing it across the back of the middle. They they don't think they can get a quality shot, and they play it across the middle. Um, it, it's good when it works, and it's great for Portland in this case, but there's a little piece of me that says, why would you pass up a, sh a, a clear opportunity to put a shot on goal, even if it is a header, right? Typically a little lower percentage chance, but put it on frame rather than playing it across back the middle. Maybe, maybe they think they're catching the goalie out of position. I don't know, but let's take a quick look at some of the stats here for Red Bulls drawing Portland 1-1, uh, about 50-50 possession, uh, some, some shots on goal for both teams, Red Bull with four, Portland with just one, and they convert it, there we go, uh, decent number of passes, but very low percentage of passing accuracy, 73 for the Red Bulls. Uh, almost 70% for Portland. Now, Portland does kind of like to sit and, and counter, so that accounts for that. And the Red Bulls, we know, kind of the pressing, counter-pressing team. So maybe not outside of the realm of, of typical passing statistics for these teams, but still relatively low across the league. Uh, I do want to check out the yellow cards here. Just two yellow cards this game. You know, for, for a, a, a Chara brothers game as well as a red bull team that really likes to put pressure on only two yellow cards so maybe the league is easing off a little bit and we check out the expected goals here 1.2 for red bull and 0.5 for portland so solid result i think for both team picking up points not losing any ground in the standings as far as red bull and not falling further down the standings for the timbers uh hey red bull fans how are you feeling about your team right now no no home wins uh, even though you're perfect 5-0 and on the road, is this the year? Is this the year the Red Bulls are going to finish top four and really make a deep playoff run? Uh, and similarly, Portland fans, is your window closed? Do you think you guys are going to make the playoffs this year? We're in week 10. We're about a third of the way into the season. Things are starting to take shape a little bit, and I'm a little worried about Portland. I think their championship window is closed unless they bring in a couple big summer signings, which I don't think they have the money or the roster space to do. This might be it for Portland. Anyway, let's let's move on. Uh, we're going to stay out east. We're going to stay in New York, as a matter of fact, with New York City drawing Sporting Kansas City 0-0. Again, another non-conference matchup and really another surprising uh, result here because New York City has scored 14 goals in their last three games and Kansas City hasn't won a match since March 26th. Mike I'm assuming you picked a New York City win in your betting picks and predictions. I hope you didn't put too much money down on an NYCFC win on this game because that's that's what all signs were pointing towards, and instead Kansas City comes away with, with a, a good road point. Maybe not the worst thing in the world for New York because it is a non-conference opponent. New York has rattled off three straight wins. But for Kansas City, who has been struggling to score goals and get points this season, 
take the road victory and head back to Kansas City and see what you can do with it. Now, really, this was a game of missed chances. Tim Melia had a huge save in the 33rd minute. Kansas City hits the post three minutes later. In the second half, Sean Johnson falls backwards to, to save a deflected shot. New York City had a few shots go just wide of their post or of Kansas City post in the second half. So just a lot of missed chances, uh, even though there was only three shots on goal for each team. Not a huge surprise here on the possession standpoint. 74% almost for NYCFC, 26 for Kansas City. Uh, Kansas City looking to hit on the counter, especially in the small NYCFC stadium against the team who loves to have possession. Uh, but what really killed me is, is the 61% possession for Kansas City. They, they did not look like they had their legs under him or that they were able to string together passes. It was all counterattacking here. Only three yellow cards in the game, so hopefully that's the trend. Not a lot of yellow cards coming. Hopefully the league is kind of stepping back on what they were doing before. But, man, I think this is the first time I've ever seen a possession interval where no team has ever dominated a f or ever had an e edge on a five-minute possession thing. This is insane. I've never seen this before. Um, anyway, we look at the expected goals. 1.4 for NYC, 0.3 for Kansas City. Again, another terrible offensive performance for Kansas City, something we're used to without Polito, without a striker. Uh, and NYC just could not convert any of their chances. So this was, again, a game of missed opportunities and a, and a game of no offense for Kansas City, but for a couple counterattacking opportunities. I don't think this means anything in the grand scheme of things for these two teams. Uh, we will keep New York rolling, and Kansas City will continue to try and take points on the road as they come. Now let's take a look. Again, we're going to stay in the East Coast. I'm just running through the schedule as it occurs. I don't have an East Coast bias or an Eastern Conference preference. In fact, I love how open a lot of those Western Conference teams' games are. But we're just running through the schedule here, folks. And that allows you to tune in when you need to, right? DC 2, Houston Dynamo 0. I, I love this result because it's Taxiarchis Fontas, the DP signing for DC United with 2. And I love it for a couple of reasons, right? I love it because DC is hitting on a DP player, right? Edison Flores was supposed to be the guy a couple of seasons ago, but between injury and coaching and, and everything else that happened with them, it, it just did not work out for him. And he's a bit of a bust as a DP, a solid player, but not at the DP level, right? So they bring in Texi Artikis Fontes to help jumpstart their offense. And this guy is off to a great start. I think he's already at maybe four goals, three or four goals after this performance. Love it. The other reason I love it is because he's a fellow countryman of mine. Plays for the Greek national team. Great to see another Greek doing it right in the league. So Houston, it's a setback, non-conference opponent. I don't think you can get too hung up on it, right? Fontes has a great game. Houston didn't travel. And let's take a look at the stats. Houston actually has the edge on possession, but DC dominated the offensive opportunities here. Let's keep scrolling down. Five red cards, that, or five yellow cards this game. Um, so let's see if any of those players, if, if you guys are fans of either ones of these teams, or if you've got these teams as your opponents, maybe there's going to be some accumulation you can take a look out for. Overall, the passing numbers are what they are. Possession intervals vary as usual, but DC with only 0.9 expected goals and Houston only having 0.7. So not creating those high quality chances that we are used to seeing. Now we're going to stay in New England. Again, keep the, the East Coast New England theme going here. And man, was this a game. 2-2, two to two, New England draws Columbus. Goals by Columbus's Barry in the 27th. Then Jones and Buxa equalize and put New England up in the 70th and 82nd. And then you've got Hurtado in the 89th minute for Columbus to equalize. Connor, I know you're out there watching, man. Connor knows crew. Connor McCabe on YouTube. All things crew uh, and crew too as well. Does a lot of watch-alongs, um, some, some post-game presser reviews and things like that. So follow Connor McCabe for your Columbus crew feedback. But, man, he put out a tweet after New England got that second one. It was very negative. It was, ah, oh, here we go again type of vibes. I'm like, Connor, man, stick with it. I got a feeling that the Revs are going to choke. Like, that was it. It wasn't so much I'm high in Columbus. I just had a feeling that this Revs team has is just mentally out of it. And that's exactly what happened on that equalizing goal. 
Columbus just came right down the middle of the field on him. You even heard Charlie Davies, uh, the broadcaster for New England, former player, former USMNT player, just totally disappointed. He, I, I think he said that it was unacceptable and maybe even embarrassing were the words he was used to see New England give up such a late goal, right? You could see the look on the players' faces. You could see that they were just stunned. So that is what I, I, I'm getting from this New England team. On the flip side, great to see Columbus fighting to the end. I kind of had a hunch Columbus would maybe start to have some lapses and not play well after not just the Zardis departure, but Porter's comments about, oh, Zardis just isn't good enough. Let's get him out of here. Like, the way, at least they're, that didn't affect the team negatively, right? Anyway, let's take a quick look at the stats here before we take our short little break. Columbus with only 35% possession. Again, New England, we know them. They like to have the ball. They like to play. Columbus, maybe they are starting to settle in a bit of that defend and counterattack strategy. Columbus fans, crew fans, Connor, let me know. Is Columbus starting to kind of bunker and counter? Um, let's see if the pa- uh, possession intervals play that out, that maybe they had some possession late in the game to get that equalizer. Nope. They sure did not. So great, great come from behind draw for Columbus. Both teams with about one expected goal this game, so not too much offense going on. All right, sons of a pitch listeners and viewers, SO peeps, we are going to take a short break. And on the YouTube side of things, you're going to see our sponsor, Skira Icelandic Spring Water, go out, quench your thirst. Man, I've been talking a lot. I definitely could use some Skira right now to kind of soothe the vocal cords here, to kind of massage the throat, get some of that Icelandic kind of magic that's in the water over there, right? Uh, Go out, find that at your nearest 7-Eleven. On the podcast side of things, stay tuned. You're going to hear a brief word from our sponsor, and then you're going to hear John Donovan's take on all things Chicago Fire. So fans, stay tuned now for a short break. As soon as I can figure out the technology, I'll get there eventually. Here we go. All right, SO peeps, are we refreshed? Are we ready? Have we looked up directions to the nearest 7-Eleven to get your Skira Icelandic spring water? Let's do it. All right, back with the second half of our show. Here we go. Minnesota versus Cincinnati. And ladies and gentlemen, Cincinnati with the late, late, late game winner, the stoppage time winner from Brandon Vasquez in 90 plus three. Friends, Cincinnati is on a three-game win streak. They're first in their MLS history. They've won two games in less than a week for that. And away at Toronto and away at Minnesota were two of those three. So this isn't some like homecoming, early season, whatever type of thing. No, this is a legitimate three-game win streak. For Cincinnati, they are rolling. And here's the crazy thing, folks. Who are the next two opponents that Cincinnati gets? The struggling, struggling Chicago Fire and a reeling, emotional New England Revolution. I'm not saying Cincinnati is going to have a five-game win streak, but Cincinnati could very well have a five-game win streak going. Crazy to think of how far they've come in just one short half season or third season so far. Anyway, let's take a quick look at these numbers, and we're going to keep an eye on Minnesota in the standings. I feel like they're a little further down than they thought they would be at this point in the season. So 52 to 48% for Minnesota uh, as far as the possession goes. Shots and shots on goal about even uh, for both of these teams. 14-15 shots, uh, 5-6 and six shots on goal. Um, passing about average, right? A lot of passes, maybe not the most accuracy. Uh, And here, let's double check those yellow cards. Three for Cincinnati. I'm sure that was in part, um, you know, preventing some of those Minnesota 
goal scoring opportunities. Uh, Loons fans, I got to ask, how are you feeling after this loss? I mean, it, it, and fans around the league, do you feel like losing to Cincinnati is that same terrible, terrible feeling as it has been the last three seasons? Or is this a little bit different? They got Vas Vasquez, you know, firing on all cylinders and they're playing a little bit more organized, structured soccer here. Does, does it feel too bad? I guess it shouldn't at this point. Um, but Loons fans, I know you got to be feeling like you needed to win this game at home. Uh, meanwhile, Cincy fans, how do you feel, right? Is, is you feeling good? Are you happy? Are you feeling a playoff push maybe? Yeah, I might be getting ahead of myself. Let's see how the next several games work out for them. But as we look, Cincinnati with two expected goals and Minnesota with just one. So both teams did have a couple quality opportunities here, just couldn't find the back of the net on those. And it was Cincinnati that ends up with the three points. Congrats to Cincinnati. Let's see how they do over the next couple games. I hope they don't beat the fire, but they look like they're going to beat the fire. Mike, I'm interested to hear what your betting picks are going to be for that game. Now, moving out west, Dallas hosting Seattle, and Dallas taking care of Seattle 2 0 with goals by Jesus Ferreira and Paul Ariola. A couple USMNT players there getting on the stat sheet, hopefully coming into good form before they get into uh, some international friendlies leading into the World Cup. Now, this is a great result for Dallas, right? They pick up three points against a conference opponent who we know is going to be competitive by the end of the year, right? So this is excellent for Dallas. The, great timing, too, catching them on the back of their CCL victory. And, again, we already talked about how Jao Paulo tears his ACL and is out for the season for Seattle. So Seattle's midfield is going to have to adjust real quick on how they want to play. And, uh doesn't look like they had too many good opportunities without Paulo pulling the strings there for him. Now for Seattle, again, we can understand why they came out a little flat here, why they came out and could not find the back of the net. But they do not have much wiggle room from here on out. You're going to see where they're at in the standings. They are second worst in the Western Conference, only to Vancouver, who, as we see, actually wins their game this week. So Seattle's got to start grabbing some points here before they fall too far behind right now they're seven points off that playoff line but let's take a look at the stats um again dallas with some excellent play 57 percent possession six shots on goal that's fantastic meanwhile seattle did not have a shot on goal this game and only had four total I'm going to give Smets the benefit of the doubt. I'll give Coach Brian Smetzer the benefit of the doubt. I, I don't know him that well. I'm, I don't know him at all. I don't know him personally. I shouldn't call him Schmetz. That was, that was faux pas on my part. My fart? My part. Wow, I really need some skira to quench my thirst here and get, get the lips moving in sync with the brain. Anyway, I will give Brian Schmetzer and Seattle the benefit of the doubt on this one, right? We knew they were going to struggle in this match coming off the CCL win, whether it was a, a victory hangover or whether it was a Jao Paulo hangover or whether it was just tired legs. Um, but to not have a shot on goal is a little bit concerning, uh, despite having 82% passing completion rate, a, a solid passing completion rate there, and 16 crosses, come to think of it. So as we continue to scroll down, um, we look – Look at this spray chart here, right? Dallas was just peppering the Seattle goal from all angles and all distances. Meanwhile, Seattle with just their kind of four shots over here, or their three shots, right? One was blocked, so I don't think that registered there. Looking at the expected goals, though, Seattle did have 0.7 expected goals, so they had one decent opportunity uh, but could not convert it. Meanwhile, Dallas with the 2.7 XG falling about where they needed to to walk over the win. So Seattle Sounders fans, are you concerned at all right now? Are you? I mean, even if you don't win anything else the rest of the season, you come away with the trophy, you come away with a piece of history being the first MLS squad to win CONCACAF Champions League, but you still got to make the playoffs, right? Like if you fail to make the playoffs, if you fail to win a U.S. Open Cup game, but come away with the CCL trophy, I got to imagine there's a little – there's going to be a little pain there. Meanwhile, Dallas, just keep rolling. Keep getting those points and stay in the playoff mix. That'll be a huge improvement from last season for them. Now, San Jose with a victory over Colorado. one nothing thanks to a Cardoso 64-minute 64 64 strike. Uh, for some reason, the way my life has worked out, I have ended up watching a lot of San Jose Quake soccer over the last three, four weeks. I don't know if it's just 
the, the time my wife has dinner ready versus my kid's bedtime versus the things I do on my honey-do list. And then I just kind of settle in and I'm like, ah, the Quakes have just kicked off. Let's flip over to that Western Conference game sometime around, you know, 9, 10 o'clock central time here, right? But I have got to notice that the Quakes are playing a lot more organized soccer since the departure of Matias Almeida. And it seems like that is translating to a little bit more offensive confidence, right? The players on San Jose know how to spring a counterattack because they're not always struggling to find their marks in a man marking system. They're able to run off and not have to worry about getting back and finding their guy. So they're a little more fluid. They're a little more confident going forward and a little bit more organized on the defensive side of thing. And it's paid off. They've had a decent run of form and three points at home to Colorado. Excellent result for them. Now, Colorado, I'm going to see if the numbers bear out on this. I watched some of the, you know, I, I watched a lot of this game. I watched the highlights recently too, just to kind of re- refresh my memory on it. I don't recall Colorado being too offensively threatening despite bringing on Giassi Zardes. Maybe the loss of Shinashiki was bigger than the addition of Zardes with the way that Colorado has played. Or maybe last year was just a fluke and they're going to fall back to that fighting for a playoff spot team that they've been the last few years. Let's take a look at the numbers and see if it backs it up. San Jose was 60% of the possession. Uh, Meanwhile, Colorado, five shots on goal of 13 shots. Eh, Respectable. Um, Decent number of passes here. Getting in 11 crosses, winning their duels. So definitely challenging for those 50-50 balls and winning the majority of those 50-50 balls in this game, as well as look at those tackles. So they were doing their job but it just didn't translate into offense, it looks like. And and really the nail in the coffin for that one is going to be the expected goals, 0.7 for Colorado. So what when Colorado had the ball, they were not able to turn it into anything threatening. And again, let's take a look at the passing. Um, passes in the attacking half and final third and the crosses, very, very low success rate for Colorado on that one so that's kind of my take on colorado is that they need to get their offense back on track and hopefully i I like jesse's artist i like him as a player i love him for columbus i love him for the usmnt maybe he just doesn't have it right now and isn't in form uh but i'm hoping he can help spring this colorado offense and and give them a little oomph as they roll into the middle part of this season next we're going to the marquee matchup this was the big matchup best in the west hosting the best in the East. And as everyone complained about it on Twitter, it was like the primetime game for MLS. Um, You have your best teams, you have your stars, but it was on at like a 10 o'clock time spot on, uh, on, I think, was it Fox or something like that? A, A channel maybe not a lot of people have subscriptions to. Anyway, it ends up being just a thriller of a game. First, you have Gazdog for Philly, scoring in the ninth minute. LAFC levels in the 56 with an Apoku strike. Escobar gives them the lead in the, or, or, and then Carranza for Philly comes back and gets the lead. And LAFC draws level again in the 82nd minute thanks to an Escobar goal. Like it was back and forth. It was great action. Let's see. What else do my notes say on this one? Uh, was this an MLS Cup preview? Potentially? Maybe? If Philly can actually make the playoff run and if LAFC can maybe get get by a, a lower seeded team in, in the semis, uh, in the conference semis, we'll see. We'll see. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves too much here. I've done that in the past. Never worked out for me. But what I like from Philadelphia is Gazdag is becoming the man for them as far as like scoring goals. In the past, they had done it by committee. You had Shabilko. You had... Uh, a number of guys who were up there and, and their names escaped me. And I remember Shabilko just because they transferred him to the fire and he was supposed to be the guy for the fire and he's not working out very much for them. Um, but, but they had guys by committee who, you know, one would get hot and then cool off and another one could step up and do it. So f- you always had to guard three or four different guys when you were playing against Philly, there wasn't one main threat for them. But now they're changing a little bit of how they play and focusing, getting Gazdag as many good opportunities as they can. And now he's got five goals on the season through 10 games. Not too shabby. If he ends up with, you know, 12, 15 goals and, and maybe a handful of assists, it'd be a pretty good season for him. Uh, and then if Philly still has some of those role players playing well, it'd be an excellent season for Philadelphia Union. 
On the flip side, you got LAFC, who's hosting the best team in the East. This is a huge test for them, and they continue to fight and create some great scoring opportunities. Vela has a pretty good game, and they come away with the point at home. So, excellent. I um, actually really wanted to point out one thing. On that on that equalizing goal for LAFC to, to tie it late, Philly gets caught ball watching. You know, Andre Blake is able to deflect the shot out and it and the Philadelphia player Carranza jumps on it and or I'm sorry, the LAFC player Escobar jumps on it while the Philly defender was just kind of watching the deflection, not watching his man. Anyway, let's take a quick look at the stats before we jump in the last couple games of the weekend. So LAFC with the majority of the possession, the majority of the shots and the shots on goal. So good for Philly for taking advantage of what they had. Only three yellow cards in this game. So thank you, pro referees, for not making this a, you know, a card festival over here. Um, let's see. Intervals. Look at that. Once again, LAFC dominated every interval of possession. So similar to that NYCFC anomaly that we saw earlier. And meanwhile, we have LAFC with 1.4 expected goals, Philly with 1.1 expected goals. So both teams exceeding that, making the most out of some uh, some low percentage chances there. So that's great to see. That means you're seeing great striking. That means that you're seeing players playing to the best of their ability. And yeah, they were jumping on some of these shots. So like these rebounds, I don't believe that they're scored very highly as far as expected goals go. Um, but someone with a little bit more of a advanced stats background is going to need to verify that for me. All right, let's keep it rolling here, guys. We have another ter- uh, Canadian matchup here, Vancouver hosting Toronto and uh, to St. Ricketts puts it away for the Whitecaps in the 90th minute as Vancouver beats in-country rival TFC 1-0. I'm worried about TFC. I mean, they just dropped two games to Cincinnati, and then they drop one to rival Vancouver. I mean, they're they're non-conference, so maybe it's not as bad, but, like, you, you can't be losing to Vancouver. Nobody should be losing to Vancouver. They're the worst team in the West. They may even be the worst team in MLS right now. And for a TFC team that's struggling, this was supposed to be their bounce-back game, right? Well, wrong. Even though having 55% of the possession, they only put four shots on frame. Um, they did have some decent passing numbers here. Won the duels, but you know what? Let's look at the XG. They have 1.3, and they could not find the back of the net. So they underperformed their expected goals. Vancouver probably also underperformed, but they get the one. They get the one they needed, right? So from a statistical viewpoint, this was an even game that could have gone either way, but TFC was just not not in it, right? They were not doing what they needed to. Anyway, I'm hoping their mental state can hold up until they get Insigne here, but I wonder if he is going to be enough to keep TFC in playoff contention. TFC fans, what do you think? Is Insigne the answer? Is is Bob Bradley doing something different? Like, were they just shocked after two straight losses to Cincinnati? Let me know what you think, because this is not typical TFC soccer. Now, moving on to the next game, Nashville hosts and defeats RSL 2-0. They get their first win at their brand spanking new stadium there. Romney in the 63rd and Sapong in second half stoppage time, giving Nashville the victory and the three points. They have the edge on possession. They have a huge advantage in shots and shots on goal. Uh, Passing accuracy, 84%. Nashville having just a really, really solid offensive game here. And if you look at the shots, look at, man, they're coming in from every angle, every direction, and every distance. They mixed up their offense. That's fantastic. Great to see. Dominating the possession. And even has 2.6 expected goals to RSL's point two. So RSL really was not an offensive threat at all during this game. Not uncommon for teams that play against Nashville, a very sound and very well-organized defensive team, especially at home with that home crowd, second game, just bumping right. The one question I got to ask ourselves, what's going on with Bobby Wood? Let's let's check the lineups. Did he get in this game? Was he a factor in this game? Like I thought he was going to come to RSL, maybe find a resurgence in form, maybe something that wasn't seen in his relegation days over in the Bundesliga. I thought Bobby Wood would be a little bit more of a factor. Um, yeah, he started up top for them. Did he finish up top for them? He did. Maybe someone, maybe I'll have to take a deeper look on Bobby Wood because you know he 
he kind of intrigued me making the move back to MLS, former USMNT striker, former Bundesliga striker. I thought he'd have more of an impact on RSL's offense. I just, I just don't think. As a matter of fact, maybe we can take a quick look at Bobby Woods' uh, stats here for the year. He's only 29 years old, so he should be playing at a pretty high level. But as we look at his year with RSL, in nine games, eight starts, uh, two goals and assists. Not good enough if you're going to be a starting striker in the league, plain and simple. For the last game of the weekend now, we're going to look at Austin, who cooled off finally at the hands or the feet of LA Galaxy. Mark Delgado with a six-minute goal. And what did I say last week? If you want to watch LA, watch Delgado. As he goes, so goes LA. He's He was brought over from Vanny to help kind of run things. Uh, the way Vanny wants him to. And if he's having a good game, LA's having a good game. He scores the goal. LA gets three points. Cause and effect, right? Cause and effect. Austin, you know what? You had a six-game point streak going. If you're going to drop a game, you're going to drop a game to the other one of the other top teams in the Western Conference. So if you're Austin, you regroup. You say, all right, didn't work out the way we wanted to. Probably not the offensive performance that they wanted. Definitely not from a goal-scoring standpoint. You regroup, you move on. For the Galaxy, you take a solid victory, and you also move on because one nothing. that's not good enough. That's not what the LA Galaxy want to be doing, nor that's what they need, can be doing, right? They need to be scoring goals if they're going to keep up some of these Western Conference opponents. Anyway, let's take a quick look at the stats here. Possession, 55-45 in favor of Austin. Both teams with a number of shots and only a few shots on goal here, right? So maybe not the offensive output that we were seeing. Maybe these late-night games out on the West Coast are taking a toll on the players as well. Six yellow cards in the game, five to L.A., so that's not something you want to see. But fortunately, no reds for them. Now let's take a quick look at some of the passing numbers here. As you can see, L.A. did not have a very good passing game. Neither team had a very good passing game in the attacking third. And look at these crosses. L.A. completing 16% of their crosses. Oh, terrible. But that's not how LAFC want to play, right? They need to be going up the middle and going direct to Chicharito, not lobbing crosses into him or, or rolling crosses uh, where goalkeepers can grab them. Anyway, uh, we look at the expected goals, 1.2 xg for austin and 1.1 for la so la hits their xg austin does not get it um but that's that's what we're looking at here out west and we will see if la can kind of get rolling and get their offense rolling a little bit more and we'll see if austin can get back on track speaking of that let's take a look at the standings and let's see what surprises uh we can see with the way things are after 10 games played in the season right here. And then we're going to wrap things up. So looking at the Eastern Conference, Philly up top. Uh, they were at two or just above two points per game. So a little slip here with this draw, but that's okay. They're still a top. They have the most points in the Eastern Conference. And then rounding out the top four, New York, Montreal, Orlando. Now here are, are the surprises to me. Those last three current playoff spots, Cincinnati in the five spot, New York City and Atlanta. I was not expecting to see Atlanta around this playoff line, uh, especially without Joseph. And I was not expecting to see New York City this far low. Um, maybe I should have adjusted my expectations knowing NYC was in the CONCACAF Champions League. But really what surprises me is that Toronto, New England, and D.C. are behind Charlotte and Columbus. Um, but it's very tight, as you can see, uh, from fifth place to 10th place is only four points, right? Very tight in the East. Not something we haven't seen before. Now looking out West, you got LAFC up top with a three point lead over second place, Austin, and then LA and Dallas in the third and fourth spot as of this week. That doesn't surprise me to see the two LAFC teams. Up. It does surprise me to see Austin so high, but they are out to a flying start. Uh, the phrase regression to the mean comes to mind, but the way Austin has started and the way that they are already on 20 points through 10 games makes me think that they are going to make it to the playoffs at worst. We'll see. You got to play the games, but pleasant surprise from Austin and from Dallas sitting in the fourth spot. I am surprised that RSL and Minnesota are still above the playoff line at this point. I expected Kansas City to be better. I expected Portland to be better. I figured Portland was going to make one last push this year, uh, you know, before Blanco's knee completely goes. Um, Seattle, again, it's that same CCL thing, right? 
but they are on seven points through eight games. The only reason they're ahead of Vancouver is because Vancouver is on seven points through nine games. Seattle has to start finding some points here. They are seven points off the playoff line, and they are 16 points off the top in the West. They need to start finding points before the number of games starts running out. Well, fans, that is our MLS recap for Week 10. Thank you to you all for viewing, for listening, for putting up with my voice for the last, oh, 45, 50, 55 minutes or so of your life. And, and honestly, it really means a lot that you choose to take an hour of your time every week to listen, to chat, to interact, to, to share these thoughts with me and to everyone in the Sons of a Pitch community. So make sure that you like the video, that you subscribe, turn on the notifications so you can join us live in the chat next week and share your thoughts with everyone out here. We got one of the best communities of soccer fans in America, I think. I think we have had a core group of definitely 20 to 30 people who are in and out every week, not to mention everyone else that jumps in and out of these chats. The messages we get, the emails we get, we thank everyone for reaching out to us. Subscribe, like, share. Send the super chats. Throw a few bucks our way. Every dollar we make gets reinvested into our Sons of a Pitch, Soccer Central broadcasting, whether it's software, whether it's technology, whether it's taking out some ads to keep drawing in some new listeners like we put all the money back into. Uh, it's not going to my kid's college fund. That's for sure. I'm hoping we can, we can get a soccer scholarship. So, hey, anyone in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, you want to start scouting my little guy here, we'll reach out. Let me know. Anyway, also subscribe to my channel, Wife, Children, House, over on YouTube. The best thing that you can do is search for Backdraft Chicago Fire Recap, and that will take you to a playlist of all my Chicago Fire Recaps, and you can bounce around the site there. Look me up on Twitter, at Wife Kids House. And everyone, thank you again for all your viewing. We appreciate it for all your support. It's it's much appreciated. Happy Mother's Day again to all you moms, to all you soccer moms especially. Gosh, I can still think back to my mom's red minivan with all the soccer decals on the side as we're driving around Rockford from tournament to tournament, game to game. It was fantastic. Anyway, love you, Mom. Miss you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day to everyone out there, and we will see you all next week.